Okay, that should now be connected. Welcome everybody to today's bank holiday special. Sorry, Ross, if that's inappropriate for your individual perspective, but Josh and I felt the need to uh, jump on today, having had three days off of the grind and the hustle of being entrepreneurs, but most of all, just a bit of entertainment and uh, hopefully some value and advice for people that are looking in to entrepreneurship. So without further ado, I'm going to bring Josh in. Hello, Josh. Hello, Martin. Good morning. We are in the morning. No, afternoon. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Absolutely me. Yeah, I'm good, thanks. It's uh, the sun shining today. It was a bit of deadly wind last night. I think that come out of nowhere. Um, woke us we up. had some massive storms in Cambridge here last night. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it was pretty strong. So, um, yeah, well, as we were just sort of prepping, it's uh, today's chat is around disability and entrepreneurship, and we've both got a few war stories and a few advice and tips to, to give. Um, I guess the one thing was just that we get that in the climate of COVID-19, there's not going to be a rush of people, you know, necessarily starting a new business. I mean, actually, when, when economy is struggling, it can be a good time for opportunity and for new ideas to flourish because the run of the mill day to day stuff isn't happening. So I wouldn't want to suggest that nobody should start a business now. But I think we're both just aware that some of our advice and stories are going to be contextual. Um, but I think also that there are some, you know, I know you've had to do a few bits and bobs because of COVID-19 with your business. So I think we'll, we'll touch upon a few different points. But are you all right just to give a little introduction, Josh, and a bit about who you are and what your business has been? Sure. Um, so obviously, I'm Josh Winterskill. Uh, back in 2017, I was on a holiday uh, and came up. With a with a with a with a business idea whilst drinking Corona, uh, which I know sounds a bit ironic, mm -hmm. is the lager um, and a book called Start with the Why by Simon Sinek. And for those who um, are thinking about starting a business, it's probably a book worth reading um, with 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 some form of alcohol in your hand. It kind of um, ignites some sort of um, innovative brainwaves. Um, it, it it was really interesting. Uh, so I sat by the pool in Tenerife uh, for a lot of uh, disabled folk. You're probably aware of the Mary Soul. Um, and that was kind of where the light bulb moment happened, where um, I was fed up of traveling um, by air. Uh, and for those in wheelchairs that require physically lifting on and off the aircraft will know all too well the issues that are faced with that. So um, I came up with this sort of idea of designing a, a, a seat and a sling, combining it into sort of one product. To really just sort of make that overall process of getting on and off the aircraft uh, more smoother and i came at the time when i came up with this sort of brainwave idea um i i, I was sat by the pool with my phone and i put into google um what i wanted to see so i thought i'd type in like transfer seats for aircraft uh, and, and and interestingly nothing came back that i wanted to see and i've always said if you put something into google and nothing comes back in what you want to see it's like winning the lottery but not winning the money the odds are so slim um and i kind of knew that there was potentially something there and you know at the time i was on a holiday i was working full time and when i came back from the holiday i started doing some research um and you know what the last two years it's just kind of spiraled out of control um and and sort of you know if we, we cut a long story short you know i'm now running running the business and we'll probably touch base a little bit more about that journey later on um but now I've, i'm sort of just coming up to two years this summer from the inception of the idea and running a business so uh you know i left my full-time job as well which was a, a, a difficult challenge to leave you know it was it was a good job you know it paid well you had the security there and and you know to make that leap into entrepreneurship um is is quite an interesting one to do so uh, you know, I, I haven't met many disabled folk that have done that. And so when we speak with like, my, when I speak with like minded people like yourself and others, Martin, it's, um, it kind of inspires me to encourage other people into the world of entrepreneurship as well. Um, because there's, there's a lot in there that has to offer for disabled people, I think, entrepreneurship. 
uh, in terms of its flexibility. But obviously, you know, there are there are risks. You know, you're giving up that. You know, in in the short term, you're giving up that stability of a full time job. Um, you know, so you know, there's lots of inherent risks. But I think from a disability standpoint of view, there's so many benefits of being an entrepreneur. Yeah, no, that was a a perfect introduction. I mean, at your personal story and journey I, I remember when you came up to our stand at nadex and it was really the earlier days of the idea and starting to try and bring it to reality and then one year later only one year you'd you know won awards in terms of some finances but general recognition you'd started manufacturing you're already selling and it was phenomenal to see how quickly you got as you say from that idea with start start with why and a corona beer so then actually having a product and a company was very admirable how how quickly you did that and i think you sort of set the the tone nicely for a few topics around you know the personal benefits of lifestyle can be good with a disability around solving a problem that you faced as a disabled person that can help the community as well through the business um even on to like creating jobs and opportunities for other disabled people there's there's certainly a lot to unpick um i guess let's just start with where we are now in terms of the, the climate i mean how how has covid19 I mean, i'm sure that how it's affected you on a personal level is going to be similar to some of the people that have been on the daily sib around the care the shopping and do feel free to throw in a couple of thoughts there as well. But how, how has it affected the business for you? Uh, look, you know, I'm, I'm not going to beat around the bush. You know, the travel industry has has taken its biggest hit, I think, ever pretty much. Um, and yes, Chris, Corona Beer does offer so much. You're right. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think that the travel industry, yeah, it's, it, it's taken a pummeling. Um, you know, we've seen airlines all over the world you know, grinding, grinding flights to a halt for all the right reasons. Um, and, you know, people, people aren't going to be traveling now. And as a, as a business that was built off the back of the, the travel industry, we are obviously heavily reliant on that. Um, and there's other uses of our product that can be used, not just for aviation um, and, and more travel related, you know, activities. But again, people aren't traveling so much. So, you know, people, people haven't really, you know, people might be planning actually it's probably a really good opportunity now to start planning for those holidays in the future i know it's difficult to know when to be planning for but um you know a lot of us disabled people have to do tremendous amounts of research and planning before we even look at booking a holiday um so people might be coming across us in the meantime uh, but i think you know you've as a business in times like this uh, certainly as a small business it's it, it's fundamental that you kind of try and keep things ticking along as best as you can uh, and preserve as much sort of spare capital, i.e. cash that you can as well in the bank um, so that, you know, as we sort of come out the other side of this, you can kind of capitalise hopefully on, um, you know, a booming travel industry. I think it's going to take, you know, a good couple of years. I was reading something the other day uh, on the Financial Times that it's expected for the aviation numbers to get to where we were in 2019. Um, they're expecting it to take at least two or three years before we achieve those numbers again, um, which is quite a long time. And I think from, yeah. from a disability standpoint of view, um, you know, we were really building some fantastic momentum in industry, um, you know, from mm -hmm. the works of Chris Wood, Flying Disabled, you know, you've got Graham Race at QEF, um, you know, you look at some of the other other people in the background at Heathrow Airport, like Samantha Saunders and, you know, all of the all of these great guys, Celine at EasyJet, you know, they're all really pushing momentum for change in the in aviation for disabled people. And it's a shame that, you know, we were we were finally getting somewhere. And, and, and now, obviously, I think, in my personal opinion, that might take a slight step back in terms of priority, um, certainly for mm -hmm. airlines to focus on disability. It will still be there, of course. But obviously, you know, their main priority now is figuring out when are we actually going to start getting back to normal um, and what will that new normal even look like, Martin? You know, we, we just have no idea. And I just really hope that some of the really good airlines that, you know, prioritise disability, um, that they don't have serious long-term effects from this, i.e., 
Um, you know, some we, you know, it might be that some airlines may even go bust. We looked at Flybe. You know, um, they got bailed out by 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 the government, and you know, their last straw or nail in the coffin was coronavirus, and they just couldn't continue. Um, and so there is a real threat that you know some of these good airlines are at risk, um, and that the industry as a whole may take a, a while to get back to where it should be. Um, but again, you know, we're we're in the hands of, of the gods, really. Um, so that's kind of my sort of view at the moment on the industry in terms of the business uh, and our business. Um, I've furloughed one worker um, and I'm furloughing probably myself as well, um, you know, again, to just maintain that cash um, for, for, for as long as possible. Uh, you know, we can I've, I've got a support worker um, through Access to Work, which I'll touch base on shortly, um, where I will have Lorraine, you know, doing a lot of the work in the background. You know, if, if, if we do get the odd orders coming through, um, there's various, you know, accounting and all that sort of stuff that still needs to be done. Um, and, you know, as a as a founder and director, um, I can still those do those duties as a furloughed worker. Um, so it's really just trying to, you know, figure all of these little nuances out in terms of how best to manage the business to keep everything going along whilst you're, you know, making sure that the business survives through these times. And, you know, the government have given what three months, I think it is, of, of funding. And the question is, is for a lot of small businesses, um, three months probably isn't going to be long enough. And if the if the if the measures are released in, say, six weeks time or three weeks time, are small businesses really going to have enough business around um, long enough when they when people do start coming back to maintain themselves? You know, it could be. You know, certainly, like I said, with aviation, it could be two to three years. But other businesses, you know, they might only have spare cash to last them three or four months from when, you know, this retention scheme finishes. And, you know, if they don't get the business in, well, they might go bust. So, you know, there's a lot at stake here. But I think if we take it one step back and we look at people that don't have a business yet, um, now is probably the perfect time to actually yeah, start yeah. planning what you might want to do as a business idea and 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 actually there probably now is a lot more new business ideas that have come out from the impact of coronavirus you know there'll be people in the workplace that have realized oh actually you know you might be a business owner you might have six staff working in a small office but because of because of coronavirus everyone's working from home and people are starting to yeah. use you know more video technology um and the way that we work uh, as a small business and even larger businesses will change, I think, for the foreseeable future as well. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, all I advise is people that are using Zoom probably to refrain from using it for the for, for the time being. I think there's some security concerns going on there. Um, mm -hmm. but, you know, I, I th it's a really good time. You know, we've got a lot of time now to sit down and really get those ideas out onto paper, start drawing them out, and start putting a plan together. You know. Um, there's lots of really good tools out there to use. Going back to 2017 when I started, uh, I ha really had no idea where to start. You know, you just had this idea um, and it's all, you know, how do I get financing? How do I use my, you know, my savings at the time to really get going? How do I draw a plan? You know, is my idea actually even going to work? Um, so you have lots of doubts at the beginning. Well, yeah, uh, so I'm sorry to cut in a second, just but what well, one thing I wanted to just bring up was Gavin's comment. Um, because I think you know we want to keep the comments where, where we're at with the conversation. So Gavin said, No way, no retreat, no yeah. surrender, welcome out, we'll still be at Edinburgh Airport, and we're already take, talking to airports in the US. I mean, I think from your side, Josh, it was more as an industry, people aren't gonna be going straight back on an aeroplane. Right. even when the restrictions are lessened because they're still going to be quite fretful of catching the virus. And then even as the mainstream are more back to normality, obviously the the group with underlying health conditions, aka, you know, some parts of the disabled community are going to be more, you know, wary of traveling abroad, et cetera, et cetera. So I think you're right that it's going to take a while to get the demand and the numbers back. But I think we'd all agree, me, you, Gavin, that it doesn't give the airport the right 
to drop it down the priority list either, that we can still keep the pressure up. And as you say, the airports can take a bit of time to plan and to get their head around how to be ready once we get back to that point as well. And I think, you know, Gavin's point there, you know, the fact that the the app will still be at Edinburgh Airport and they're talking with airports in the US, you know, that that is that is the prime example of airports still, you know, looking to, you know, adapt their airports to suit disabled people. And 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 yes, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Now is the best time than ever, you know, where demand is low that they can focus on, you know, changing change changing things that don't work from what they've learned before. So so I absolutely agree, um, you know, that, that that's right. Uh, but those who w do will need the service. Absolutely, Gavin. Yeah. And I think what's interesting from my perspective and I look at sort of from my business and my t my target market, it's really interesting that, you know, me and you, Martin, we need to be lifted on and off an aircraft. Right. So so we're, mm -hmm. we're within the social distancing guidelines of these these special assistant staff. And I was on a I was on a call the other the other week um, with with a company called Ozian who we were doing a sort of the first PRM leadership conference call virtually um, with various airports and other stakeholders. I think from airlines potentially on the call. I wasn't I wasn't aware, but it was certainly a global call. And I I put the question forward to them. I said, okay, so you know, let's say the government's released re released these restrictions in six weeks, and people like myself want to go flying but yet the social distancing mm. shielding rules are still in place. Um, what, what's the consequences? Are special assistant staff still going to lift me on the aircraft because of these guidelines? And actually yeah. the short answer was yes, they would. Um, there is an inherent risk that they know that they're going to have to do that. And ultimately it's the passenger's discretion that obviously if the assumption is if I think if they are at the airport willing to fly, then they're clearly okay to be lifted onto the aircraft. Yeah. But I thought, you know, it's quite an interesting point to just see whether or not, you know, our airlines, you know, or, or airports and the providers for their staff sort of get getting ahead and trying to look at when those numbers might spike back to ensure operationally that they've got the right people in place at the right time to support that level of demand. Because obviously, if there is all mm. of a sudden an instant rush and, you know, air airports and airlines aren't preparing for that, that the, the sort of the forecast of people coming back, it could quite easily be, they could quite easily get overwhelmed. Um, and then all of a sudden you have, you know, a PRM service that's completely swamped. So I think it's, you know, from an industry point of view, um, it's quite interesting to sort of learn about how they're sort of planning for the future as well from the coronavirus impact. And that, and then obviously that flows down to me and getting an idea of when I'm expecting my, my target market to sort of get back flying again. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. It's one one step at a time. It's everyone's in disarray now, and then there'll be like a, a change back to whatever normality returns, and some things will change forever. Um, Do you know, so, sorry, you know what's so Rob, there. Just, just sorry, just quickly. Sure. I spoke to a client last week, and um, she's booked a holiday to go to Turkey, right, um, in September this year. And do you know how much more expensive it is to do the same holiday this time next year, uh, in September next year? Do you know how much more expensive it was? Thousand pounds. Wow. So right. the, the tourism industry is already preparing for you know the spike. So they're already putting prices up. It's it's yeah phenomenal. yeah to try and recoup. Really Obviously yeah. from their side they're going to recoup. The money and the fact that yeah the, the, yeah the, it's going to be interesting as an industry um in terms of bringing sort of back to entrepreneurship what one thing rob just said he's moved um, to facebook from linkedin for some reason linkedin comments don't appear on okay. my feed of questions so if you're on linkedin and you have a burning question then do come to youtube or facebook or twitter um i, I basically once linkedin enable it it will work but for now it doesn't so good to see you rob um a little while ago and i i wanted to bring it to chris's question once we looked at the sort of industry side that i think we've touched upon also gavin is on tomorrow so we're going to hear from 
Gavin more about what the welcome app is and around technology and customer service. But Chris is asking, at what point did you know your idea was feasible, Josh? Well, it's a good question, actually. I, you know, it was, I would probably say it was feasible after probably the good sort of four to six months of planning uh, when I'd realized that actually it was quite evident that through the research there was just not enough airports that had any form of equipment available to sort of support, you know, WCHC passengers or passengers that require lifting on and off the aircraft. And I thought, well, it's it's a bit wrong to be expected to be physically lifted under the arms and legs. Um, and I, I just thought, you know, after through the research and, you know, um, speaking to people out, out in the industry that, you know, as to say, the passengers go flying and then working with some of the airports and discussing with the airlines and working with, you know, like-minded people like uh, Chris and Graham, it was clear that there was definitely a need for something like my product out there. Um, you know, once we mm. you know, look at what other products out there, you know, like the Pro Move and the Eagle Hoist, um, there was certainly room for, you know, somebody like ourselves to come in um, and sort of, you know, add something slightly different, I think, to the industry. Um, mm -hmm. You know, th I think that was when I realized it was feasible. Uh, and, you know, once we had the prototype, did some initial testing um, and, you know, we started getting onto the aircraft and people using it, it was, you know, it was, it was really nice. And I, I'll never forget my first client um, who purchased the seat. And m one of my dreams was to swim with dolphins. And uh, I'd never mm -hmm. done it before. And I, I got a message from, 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 from this lady who bought the seat for her son. And, the, and I opened the message and it was him in the seat getting lowered down into a pool to swim with dolphins uh and i think for me that was just kind of that pinnacle moment of you know what what have you actually kind of achieved uh and that that was quite nice so you know i think i feel to answer chris's question it was probably about four to six months into the project and of course once i met chris mm -hmm. that was i was in i was hooked especially because he's a spurs yeah. yeah well being a spurs fan myself it's definitely a very good quality to look for in a human being um particularly in entrepreneurship as well. So I think I understand why the Spurs factor sold it for you there, Josh. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I think what, what I took out of your answer there is, of course, there's the, the business, into yep. like business planning, there's the finance side, there, all those sort of more nuts and bolts things that have to be there. But like why I love marketing and, so like digital influencing is, I believe, I'm not saying it's a fact, but I do believe you can change culture through storytelling and through marketing. And like when you just said that person who could use your product to swim with dolphins, like that story highlights why that was so powerful. But it, it, for me, it highlights how entrepreneurship can make the world more inclusive. So that, that one story is so more powerful than some of the nuts and bolts stuff, which you sort of need to execute. But yeah, I just wonder what your thoughts are around storytelling and, and marketing within this big picture. My thoughts around storytelling and marketing. Oh, I... From what sort of side, Martin? Just, just I want to make sure I get this right. So just yeah, well, I think it's in a way it's your experience. So it's like, how have you found that when you there's a powerful story and you've got access to social media and blogging, yeah. how yeah. much of a difference that's made, not just to having more profit, but to making a social impact as well. Yeah, look, when I when I when I first started this out, um, yes, I've always wanted to have a business, um, and yes, generating money is great. But I remember speaking to one of my friends uh, when I came to him with the original idea, and he said, "Oh, you 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 could revolutionise, you know, travel for people in wheelchairs with the device." And I, I remember saying to him, "I said, look, if I change one person's life, then I've done my job." Um, I think as entrepreneurs, we try to, you know, improve the world. 
uh, and make it a better place. Uh, and, you know, just by doing that, you know, it, it was that sense of fulfillment. And I think, you know, with social media now, it, you know, our stories can spread so, so quickly, uh, you know, and getting messages like that out there to the disabled community where if it wasn't for social media, people might not know that these types of experiences would be possible. Um, you know, really helps share our story and what our product can do to sort of change people's lives. So, you know, the platform of social media is huge and, you know, it's still something as a as an entrepreneur that we're still learning. I think it's a it's a constantly changing beast, isn't it, with social media? You learn you learn one new trick and then, you know, thousands of other people follow it. And before you know it, you know, people people realize you're spamming them with advertising. So you then need to generate a another way of getting that story to someone without you know without bombarding them with stuff they don't want to see so you know learning how to market i don't think that ever works does it you if you bombard people or they feel like you're just trying to sell it doesn't work i've like there is a business there is a product or service make money people have to make a living like that's all a given but i yeah. think with social media you're losing as soon as it's sales. I think it's more about brand and values and and the difference that your business makes. For for me, that's why it's so powerful. Yeah, and I, I and I think you know just on that you know sort of broadly speaking, if you if you read Simon Sinek's book, start with the why. Um, it's interesting his view on on when you're selling a product to people or, or a service. It, you know people. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And I think when people can relate to why you're selling something, yeah. um, it's a lot more powerful. Yeah. As soon as you get people like that, they're kind of you've kind of half got them halfway there already. Um, and then everything that follows that with your brand, your marketing, you know, um, and and that that's that's the next bit. And then you've got your sales funnel and bringing people through. But it's that first emotional attachment that you know people see with a product. Yeah that's why they buy it um and 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 that's yeah. what we got from the book so um what's we got some questions coming through there martin i think well R ross is saying the spin-off from entrepreneurship into other products should not be underestimated you can only sell your time once and my takeaway from that is that as an individual you can be a consultant freelance speaker you know where it's your time for money as one transaction the benefit of a product is obviously you can scale it and impact more people i think there's a few angles to ross's point in a good way that there's the business side that you can make more revenue make more profit but i think again from the social impact side you as josh can impact more people's life through the transit seat than you can from advising people on a one-to-one -one consultancy about how to travel in general as an example i think of what josh is saying so what is saying but have you got any thoughts on that yeah i think he's absolutely right i think you know entrepreneurship is much broader than just you know the, the product itself um you know there's lots of other sort of creative things that we as entrepreneurs do it might be you know leveraging into consultancy it might be, you know, supporting in the community. Uh, and, you know, all of this sort of adds up to a bigger picture in terms of what you represent. Uh, and I think, I think, is that what kind of Ross means that, you know, just not from entrepreneurship, but the other stuff we do outside of it shouldn't be underestimated. Yeah, I mean, it, Ross, feel free to, to clarify if um, you meant something a bit different, but yeah, that, I think we're on the same page with that, Josh. Um, yeah, and Rich is saying about almost not having a sense of competition between disabled entrepreneurs and businesses in the disability sort of industry, if you like, but that we're all trying to change the world and we can all support each other. Yeah, I think, you know, the disabled community um, is, a, is a, a classic example of a community that generally, you know, comes together really well to help each other. I think... You know, we're seeing that we're yeah. seeing that more now um, than I than I personally have done, um, and mm. we do have to work together to get through it. Uh, absolutely. 
Yeah. So um, I know there was a few bits that we were going to get through. Um, so I think we sort of touched upon marketing and social media yeah. as a powerful tool. But I think you, you are when I when I was talking through that, mm -hmm. your point about Simon Sinek and the why and the emotional connection is really where I was coming from. It's you know in the end, it's about helping people and connecting with people are making a difference to people it's not only about websites and sort of product technology it, it's all that stuff and I think we touched on that that really well now um so what one thing I wanted to talk about was funding and finances to get started I think yeah. your story is very interesting are you right to, to sort of share what happened with you in sure. that arena do you want me to touch base firstly on funding around what's going on at the moment with uh, COVID-19 or do we want to just touch base on that later and just explain a bit more about the journey in my funding now in terms of getting a business off the ground? I mean I think in a way if we're talking about funding both work and okay. so yeah like do both but start where you want to mate. I'll start from the beginning then so um, cool. getting a getting a business off the ground is uh, it's proven to be quite a, a quick turnaround for me, and I, I certainly didn't envisage it. And when I when I got the idea, uh, I got given a book by my flatmates on how to start a small business, and I started reading it, and it started talking about business plans and you know doing all the financing and forecasting. Uh, and and one of the first uh, resources that I came across was uh, the Prince's Trust. Now, the Prince's Trust has oh, yeah. a, a really good, solid document that explains how to get a business off the ground and how to write a business plan. Uh, and so I really started with that, in essence. And I, I, I read this other book that I was given from my flatmates at the time to start generating my thoughts about what the idea I had was and the research and doing all of that sort of stuff and looking at production. You know, it's so vast. And so... The Prince's Trust um, document really helped me sort of put a, um, a boundary around uh, my thoughts and getting pen to paper. Uh, and then I started pulling all of this documentation together, started designing. I, I initially worked with a, uh, an organization called Innovate UK or Innovate Design, I think it was, um, because I needed to get a prototype created. I wanted to make sure that, you know, do I need to look at any sort of protection of the device? Uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and then it kind of got to the point where it's starting to get a little bit real. You know, I, I've got this, I've got a prototype. Now I need to potentially look at, you know, getting it protected, but also bringing it to market. And then when you start realizing how much the money these people charge for getting protection is, uh, is, is, is yeah. quite amazing. And I, I soon came, I soon quickly came to the realization that the money that I had wasn't going to be enough. Um, and so uh, this is a bit of a personal story. So what happened was through the prototyping stage, I went to Heathrow Airport. I think Graham Race put me in touch with Samantha Saunders and, uh, mm -hmm. and I got invited up to Heathrow to show the device to special assistants. And me and Sam were talking just before we met the team. And she mentioned to me, uh, about whether or not I heard of, uh, heard of Leonard Cheshire and I thought I hadn't I've, I've not heard of Leonard Cheshire I just set up my Twitter account for Able Move uh, at the time uh, about a week ago before before meeting Sam and so I came back home that evening and I put in Leonard Cheshire into my Twitter and I started following them anyway a couple of weeks I think it was about a week two weeks maybe went by and I was scrolling through Twitter as you do and it popped up um, disabled entrepreneur awards um, apply now for funding or something. Uh, and I clicked on it and I looked at the criteria around it. And, you know, I quickly realized that, yes, I'm eligible. Um, have I got a business plan? Yes. Have I got a product that's ready to go to market? Yes. Blah, 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 blah. And I thought, oh, great. So I, I quickly looked uh, through the application form itself. And lo and behold, I don't think Stelios knows this. And if Tracy's watching, um, she might end up sharing it with Stelios. But it, it literally took me about half an hour to do the application because I'd already had a business plan. I already had a 20-page marketing plan. 
um, that I was working on with Business West that I was getting support from, which I'll touch base more on in a minute. And I submitted the application within half an hour. Um, and like all good things, you should never rush an application. And it wasn't until a couple of days later that I realized I missed something out in my application. So I had to, I quickly took a couple of paragraphs from my marketing strategy and put it into the, into, into my application and resubmitted it. And lo and behold, I got an email um, just after the applications are closed to say that I was one of the finalists and I'd already won £10,000. And I thought, well, that's probably the quickest £10,000 I could ever earn. Um, yeah. And, you know, it was it was by pure accident. You know, not, not accident. It was by um, sheer, I suppose, luck, really, um, that Samantha had mentioned about the, the, the Stelios Awards. Uh, sorry, Leonard Cheshire, sorry, in the Stelios Awards for Disabled Entrepreneurs popped up. Um, and what's fantastic about the awards is, uh, so Stelios, the founder of EasyJet, um, has his own philanthropic foundation arm, which puts funding into these awards. Um, and every year, I think he gives away £100,000 to disabled entrepreneurs, which is, I, I think globally, it's the largest source of funding to disabled entrepreneurs, right? This is a big thing. Um, and, you know, we need more disabled people applying into it. Uh, and Stelios has given or pledged to the, um, the is it is it the, um, oh gosh, what is it? Uh, the giving pledge, I think it is. So uh, some of the wealthiest inf philanthropist, influential people in the globe. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And they give back half of their wealth. Um, and, and Stelios, you know, does a lot of work through his philanthropic foundation into places like Greece where, you know, economically deprived from, you know, um, you know, the previous crisis years ago. And he's always giving back. And he has a really, he has a real passion in disabled entrepreneurs. Um, and it's really clear as part of these awards, um, what he represents and why he wants to give back to community. And I I got shortlisted into the top five of these awards, um, got invited to London, presented to Sir Stelios and his team, um, and then uh, we had the awards evening later that day. Uh, and uh, fortunately, um, you know, I managed to to win the competition and get thirty thousand yeah. pounds for first place. So obviously, out of nowhere, um, I've all of a sudden got some funding for the business to really kind of kickstart it. And then something really strange happened after the awards. So Stelios decided to invite me to London a couple of weeks after to discuss a deal, a brand license deal into his Easy Group family. So I'm sure a lot of you know about Easy Hotel, um, Easy Dog Walker. Um, obviously, you've got Easy Jet, uh, Easy Money. Uh, there's Easy Coffee. You know, if you go around London now um, in Fulham, um, you've got Easy Coffee Shops. He's got Easy Hub. Uh, Easy, just to quickly give you an idea, Easy Hub is a, is a great uh, place for entrepreneurs to start up businesses, to have an office of their own at low cost um, in London. It's mm -hmm. a, a brilliant. And so and it, he brought me into his family of brands um, from the awards. Is there anyone called Easy? Is there an Easy Loving version? I don't know why. Do you want to put an idea to? <laughs> just, just thinking out of the box, you know, could be a could be a new venture with Stelios. Well, I tell you, if if there's any of your entrepreneurs out there that that have got an idea that you know appeals to the masses, that's low cost, high back, easy like a Sunday morning. <laughs> oh, stop it! I'm trying to concentrate here. Um, if there if there's any of you business entrepreneurs out there that have got an idea. That's that's low cost that appeals to the masses um, that you want to bring to market or you want to sort of broaden out further. Get your ideas down now. Get onto um, Leonard Cheshire's website. Um, search Stelios Awards or just even search Stelios Awards into Google. Um, keep an eye on it. Start putting your plan together. By the way, this you, your business can be running as well. It doesn't need to be a new idea. You can be running for several years. You could have even won the awards and applied back to the awards. Um, for for further funding, so it's completely open. Mm. The awards this year are still going ahead, Martin. I believe. Um, I think they're still going to open in June. Um, I might be wrong. If if Fot if Fatini or Selena is watching, please comment. Um, but yes, keep an eye out. Do apply. 
uh, and use this time wisely now to put those uh, start you know looking at your business and putting those applications together. So that's kind of how I got into the funding world um, through the Stelios Awards and then with the brand license partnership and also Stelios did give us some further investment into the business as well, mm-hmm. which allowed me to step back from my job that I was doing at the time to really you know try and push the business forward. So that's kind of my route into funding now. Uh, depending on where you're based in the UK, uh, your different or local authorities or constituencies will have different um, support mechanisms to funding. Uh, so, for instance, uh, for myself, when I was working full time and I was developing my business plan, I leveraged Business West, which is based in the Southwest. Um, as a startup, they give you access to free professional advice. You get something like 40 hours or something of support. And then that is then allocated into the areas in which you need support for. So, for instance, when I started, I didn't really know much about intellectual property. I didn't know much about um, uh, marketing. I kind of knew what it was and you know how, how it works, but I didn't know how to actually deliver marketing myself. Um, and I still don't think you really know now. Or I, you know I'm still learning now, but the, the point was... Okay. It was the support to get your thoughts behind how you would market your product, which I think is really useful. Um, I had support on um, trying to get further investment into the business. So whether or not I didn't get investment from, you know, Stelios or if I want further investment later on down the line, it's looking at different rounds of funding. So, you know, there's so much support um, that you can get from from your local area. All you need to do really is just Google um business support or grants in my local area um and there's different businesses that will support you in in your sort of uh, regional areas so you know you've got that access to funding i know there's a couple of other awards as well i know martin i think you or shrin reached out to me about the the ms innovation awards as well um which is uh, an international award where you can win up to something like 250,000 us dollars um So you've got that to apply to. Um, Those are the sort of funding awards that I know of. But there are a couple of other um, investment channels that you can go down as a a business or or disabled entrepreneur. So, for instance, uh, a few of you will know Kaleidoscope. Um, They are an investment arm for disabled entrepreneurs based in London, ran by Hardeep. So if, for instance, maybe, you know, the Stelios Awards may not be your type of thing which i'd find hard to believe it wouldn't be um or maybe you apply for the stelio os awards and maybe you might not be successful but you still want to pursue it uh you can go to people like you know kaleidoscope where they will give you all of that really useful information support funding etc as a disabled entrepreneur um so you know do, those do you know josh if kaleidoscope have um invested in any entrepreneurs or businesses uh, is that kaleidoscope yeah. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, I, I believe they have. I don't um Hardy did give me some numbers when I met him at the Stelios Awards um, you know, the, the year that I was there in or the first year I was there, but I can't remember now, Martin. It was a long time ago. Um, and, um trying to get Hardy to to come on and maybe give everyone an update. But I know that there was a while where there was a lot of um sort of talking going on, but I hadn't heard of of actual funding, so it'd be great just to hear how the latest on that from from Hardy. Um, Gavin's asking, are these awards available for disabled CEOs? Um, I know obviously Gavin doesn't have a disability, but has a a, a technology product that is going to help inclusion of disabled people. I mean, I, my thought to that is it will depend on a case by case basis but do you know with the stelios award josh if it's only for disabled people um yeah so the stelios award criteria is you do need to have a disability to apply for the award now if for instance your business um is ran by somebody that isn't let's say a business is ran by a disabled person but it may have a director that is disabled or has some sort of equity stake in the company then that yeah can then apply to the Stelios Awards. Um, but it's always good just to check the criteria every year. I don't believe they change, but it's just useful to check on Leonard Cheshire for the criteria to apply. But I know um, that if it was Gavin applying, so, well, 
I believe if Gavin's apply, if Gavin was to apply, I don't think he would be successful because I think you need to have a disability. Okay, good to good to clarify that. Um, obviously, there's a quick mention by Gavin about Hardeep having been on well, so hopefully Hardeep is uh, back up and recovered already. Um, and Ross is asking how the current pandemic has affected you. I've got the family outside the window. Hello. Yeah, coming right. <laughs> I've got, I've got, I'm right by the window, so everyone's coming past and waving in at me. They're gonna go, they're going on the live now. I tell you, it's, um, it's yeah, but Ross is not glass. What's that, Josh? I said it's horrible looking at family through the glass, not being able to sort of you know give them a cuddle and stuff. It's just so bizarre. I know, I know. The little ones are there as well. There's little Harry and little Ava, and they're all waving. They've all got their phone out. I think they're watching it live outside the window now. <laughs> Brilliant. Wait. Can you see? <laughs> um, yeah, Ross was asking about with COVID-19, how has it affected us business-wise and have either of us furloughed ourselves? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, Ross, the answer, I think I briefly covered it beginning so it has obviously impacted us being in the travel industry um significantly uh there's no two ways about that uh and i've furloughed one of my staff already uh and looking yes to furlough myself um you know just to preserve cash for as long as possible um and you know it makes sense to use the government scheme um to you know keep the business ticking along i think it would be silly not to um you know when the funding's there it seems silly to want to try and borrow money elsewhere uh, when you can get some of that cash back from the government. Um, so that's kind of what, you know, I'm doing at the moment. In terms of the long term benefits, uh, the pandemic has made me con the pandemic has made me consider the long term benefits of being employed and the security it has provided. Well, that's an interesting one, actually, Ross. So what it'd be interesting to know your thoughts, uh, you know, of being um, being employed and the long term benefits of that um if you want to share those in the chat that'd be really interesting but my per my thoughts on that would be you know being employed um and if you're employed by an, an organization that's got you know relatively good medical cover for you private you know private health care or um you know a good pension I, I would imagine in times like this you know the larger organizations are going to be don't get me wrong they're still at risk but you, you're probably going to get maybe more support and more security maybe from them um but then on the flip side, you could arguably say, actually, sometimes smaller organisations can be um, a bit more flexible and easier to work with. Um, but obviously, sometimes there can be less security there. Yeah. And just to throw in my experience of it, I've not furloughed myself because I've still got my retainer clients. So I'm still doing the work that I was before. And yes, things may dry up down the road as a result but I just felt overall that I'm still doing my job as I always did so it didn't feel necessary to further like you have a product that is in the travel industry as you described earlier Josh my, most of my income is through freelance consultancy type work and, and on disability horizons we're still getting advertorial and marketing campaigns coming in as well um so i've not needed to to furlough myself but i mean it's still like i think new business won't be in as much of an abundance as it as it has been so it it's definitely going to hit business but at the minute i'm not furloughed anyway uh, and that's that's definitely the, the the right decision you know if your business is is still generating revenue and you can you know and you're still doing well it, you, you would be mad to furlough yourself <laughs> yeah so that's definitely uh ross is yeah. yeah there you go so that's clear oh my man's coming in free so it's important it's good to have a bit of uh, activity in the house yeah oh there she is Hi. <laughs> you're right hello how Hi. are you oh. you're good yeah, she's gone <laughs> she's gone Bye. <laughs> it's good to have it's a, be on BBC now. Yeah, it's uh, no, it's good to uh keep good water intake and fruit. So um, you know, we're uh nan nan 
So I've, I've also just got this quickly, um, this tube here. I just want to quickly mention this. So um, yeah. part of the as part of the business that I've got, we are working in partnership to provide our clients um, a free hydrant bottle, uh, which is essentially just a bottle with a tube um, that allows you to drink water without having to lift up a you know a cup or anything like that. Particularly good if you can't move your arms very well um, to, to to keep hydrated. You can clip it onto your bed, onto your wheelchair. And so what we're trying to do is is provide more value to customers as part of the business to sort of broaden that scope out. And it goes back to um, Ross's point earlier about you know. Um, your 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 business doesn't just stop with your core product it's about everything else you do around it to broaden it to provide more value back to society so um i'm very fortunate yeah. that we're working with um you know a local foundation the hydrate foundation to provide these to customers so it's, it's really really good yeah i think that's absolutely that time of sort of they use the word pivot don't they where you can change a bit of the direction of the business and that's not to say the other thing never exists again it's just that for a short term there may be some new things you can do like you mentioned with the the, the water bottle and, and things like that so yeah I think that's an important point with COVID-19 and also in in general as well right yeah so can I can I just touch on that so um if we look at if we look at entrepreneurship um and sort of you know, traits and skills. Are we okay to touch base on those, Martin, and sort of add our two pence worth in there? Yeah, I think I was going to say we we'll do that and then we'll we'll wind down. But yeah, I think if we if we sort of finish on that topic, that'd be perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I think firstly, um, you've got to have a vision as an entrepreneur. Um, it's really important to know where you want to get to. Uh, you know, you have this kind of vision on the horizon of what you want the world to look like and i think you know steve jobs and you know stephen hawkins are probably two prime examples of what they you know they visioned um and if you look at how they set that out and then sort of build everything around it how to you know sort of achieve that vision is quite astonishing um and so when i started with you know the easy uh what was the able move now is easy travel seat you know it's that vision of trying to help as many people across the globe to access you know, travel and experience other parts of the world and actually visualizing that in your own sort of thought process really helps sort of keep you on the straight and narrow. So I think firstly, have a vision. Mm -hmm. That's really, really important. Uh, I think innovation uh, or innovate in entrepreneurship is extremely important. Um, you know, we live in a world now where we, we it's changing minute by minute hour by hour you know it, it's crazy technology has just completely changed the landscape of almost every single business really um and as an entrepreneur you're always trying to find ways of you know uh in, either improving products either moving your business into a new market uh it might be you know you you might have to protect your product or service against new threats that are coming into the market um, and so in order to sort of stay one step ahead, you need to constantly innovate. Um, and, and, you know, that could be innovate within the workplace. So it could be processes that you're doing in the workplace with staff, um, you know, coming up with new creative ideas. So, for instance, you take, um, you know, this this change in workplace now with uh, COVID-19. We'll find more more businesses now working from home and trying to deliver their services or products um, via via video calls. So constantly innovate um i think you've got to be determined uh again because of change um you're going to get a lot of resistance and you've got to believe in your vision and what you represent and go and deliver that so you know it's it's believe in yourself really um i think you've got to have uh, the ability to listen um throughout sort of my uh, you know developing the business you know learning from everybody around you or listening sorry to you know uh, family business advisors that are supporting you you know even you know stelios in my in my case uh, listening to you know just even customers as well you know just just listen um and i also would say time management um as an entrepreneur it's very easy to sort of go off in all sorts of wonderful different directions and i'm probably uh um you know 
I could say I've done that myself on a couple of occasions. Um, and so sort of knowing where you need to invest your time and, you know, what your that scope looks like in terms of how you're allocating that time to it is also very important. Uh, so those are kind of my sort of key sort of traits or skills um, that I would sort of, you know, uh, pass over to anybody else that's sort of looking to start a business really mine. Yeah, no, that's really good. What I'll probably do, Josh, as well, I'll cut that that last piece you've just said down into a separate video so we can, obviously, people that can watch this back anytime they want, um, the whole hour. But mm -hmm. we'll also, I think that's a really nice, punchy bit of advice that we can put out as a, yeah, as a kind of video on its own. But, yeah, really well said and very much agree with all your points. There's a little... um comment from Ross yeah. sort of from from your direct perspective about um the key for easy travel seat is the PRM stuff it's similar to Royal Caribbean having a hoist on a jacuzzi it's all great but it's reliant on employee knowing how to use it the barriers often the people supporting the product or service No, I, you know, you you can't agree with him more. Um, um, yeah, and we got Rob. Sorry. Oh, hello. I think there's a bit of a delay, but go on, carry on what you're going to say. No, I think, you know, Ross, Ross is right, you know, with any product or service that's having other individuals using it, having the awareness is great. Um, I've always had the ethos, though, that, um, you know, if you are travelling to some rural area, that doesn't have any equipment being lifted by a, a lifting device is probably more safer physically than actually being lifted under the arms and legs, especially when you've got quite an acute disability. Um, and so in my eyes, you know, that tends to be safer than, than being physically lifted. Um, and, you know, that is, that's the way I've always been really, but I do agree the more, the more people we reach out to, to raise awareness of the easy travel seat, um, with PRM staff is obviously going to have a, a um, you know, a really good benefit. The problem is, as a small business, there's thousands of airports across the globe, and you know, trying to reach yeah. everybody at the right times, at the right stages of developing the business, um, is also a challenge that needs to be managed at the same time. So, yeah, I do yeah. agree with Ross, but obviously, you know, as we grow, the 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 um, the expectation is obviously to reach out to to more airports. And obviously, the more people travel with the seats, more airports become aware of it as well. I know um, it was a while back, Ross clarified something he's meant about scaling, and it was around the e-learning. Um, so we won't go into it all now, but I think his point is that you could scale your training and knowledge and expertise via a sort of e-learning product rather than going around to different places. Um, yep. Ross has also just meant about live captions this is bit so this bit of software that i've gradually got my head around enables us to broadcast to four different places facebook twitter linkedin youtube yeah. and apart from linkedin all the comments are coming back and enabling a really great interactivity a few people like you just here now ross have mentioned about captions the difficulty microsoft teams doesn't broadcast to four channels. However, I think I can use Google uh, Slides to basically caption what I say, but then you, Josh, on the other end, would also need to have Google Slides on presenter mode captioning what you say, and I would have to keep clicking between our shared screens to show which one is being, you know, which captions are being done. So basically, Ross, thank you for flagging. Um, I've looked into a lot more than I'll even go into on this thing now, but it is in my mind that I want the lives to be um, accessible to deaf and hard of hearing. I would also say that um, the replay goes out on YouTube and you can do the auto-generated captions on YouTube. So that's a way at least to watch the replay for now. But in terms of the live, I am trying my hardest to, to solve that. Martin, can we just quickly run over just a, a few more things quickly before we wrap it up? Or do you need to wrap it up now? Yeah, go on two more minutes and then we'll wrap it up. 
Okay, so uh, if we just quickly cover access to work, because I think that's quite an important one, certainly for our audience, mainly with, uh, you know, disabled entrepreneurs or, or even just generally in the workplace. Um, if you if you are working at the moment but may not have access to support um, because you've just not been yeah. made aware of it, um, access to work do have a scheme um, that basically supports anybody that has a physical or mental health condition that makes it hard to do your job. Um, you've got to be 16 years or over, uh, live in England, Scotland or Wales, and must be about to start either self-employment, uh, an apprenticeship or an internship or even work experience, um, or obviously, you know, already working. Um, just to sort of cover if you are on universal credit or job seekers allowance, um, you can get support from access to work, but you need to be working more than one hour um, or and you all of the following have to apply. So you need to earn for, up to 14 pounds a week, uh, work less than 16 hours a week um, and you have a, a, a designated work coach. I'm not quite sure what the work coach bit is, um, but for those that are maybe going on to universal credit now because you may have been made redundant by your employer due to coronavirus, um, and they're not looking at putting you back onto the furlough scheme. Um, obviously, you'll be going on to universal credit. So obviously, there's a very good opportunity for you to, you know, develop your business and go to access to work to start looking at getting support to help you drive that business forward. Uh, for instance, myself, I have access to a full time support worker uh, Monday to Friday, uh, nine to five uh, to help me with my business activities. Um, Ross is absolutely right. So uh, uh, if you're self-employed, you need to clear 5k of profit. I think what it is, Ross, uh, in, in your forecast, your business needs to show that you're going to do, I think it's either five or six thousand pounds worth of revenue a year or profit um, rather than um, clearing 5k profit. I think I think it's based on forecasted numbers because when I started to get my support, uh, I didn't have any uh, I didn't have any historical data. Um, so it was based on my forecast. So for those of you that are creative, um, you know, as long as you, you know, meet those numbers, you should get support. Um, so that's just very quickly on access to work. I'm just checking if I've got any more for you. Um, so also access to work in terms of support in the workplace, just very quickly, um, they can help you with adaptations to equipment that you use. I mentioned a support worker. You can get special equipment and software. So for those that require, or you know, voice recognition like Dragon, uh, naturally speaking, or other Apple type products out there, uh, if you need to purchase them, you can get that through Access to Work. Uh, you can even get a BSLE, a British Sign Language interpreter, uh, and various other sort of adaptations um, to cars uh, and various other bits and bobs. So. You know, I think access to work is, a, is an untapped pot of money that's there available to us and more of us disabled people need to start using it. Um, I've been working or advising a couple of other people, uh, thanks to Julian and Ross, actually, um, who have pointed me in the right direction that you can actually get a wheelchair funded through access to work. There is obviously criteria around that. Um, and I would touch base with anybody um, offline with that really in terms of how to, if you need to get an electric chair funded, um, then, you know, I'm more than happy to help. But, um, you know, you can do all of this wonderful stuff um, with access to work as well. So that's, that's access to work in a nutshell, really, uh, for anybody considering going into entrepreneurship or that are in current employment and need help. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think that I'm going to have to go because um, my lunch is almost ready and I'm, I'm I'm really right. off for not being ready for lunch on time. No, I'm joking. But um, I do need to head off. And I think that's a perfect end to it, Josh, because what you're saying is like if people want to touch base afterwards, like, you know, we'll get you back on in the future and have another chat like this. There's lots of people being commenting that I'm going to get to come on the Daily Sib and share their knowledge and expertise as well. But, yeah, just in terms of part in thoughts, where can people find you online and get in contact with you if they want to follow up with you after today? Yeah, so if anybody wants to touch base with Maria around anything around advice or um, uh, any advice, whether it's COVID, um, getting a business started, anything to do with the Stelios Awards 
or applying to any other entrepreneurial awards or applications, um, you know, please just drop me a line. You know, I'm more than that, uh, more than happy to help. Brilliant. And Christopher's already said he'd like to talk to you about that offline. So yeah, that's fine. Just drop me a message, Chris, and I'll uh, pick that up. And there's another question from Ross that you can pick up with him offline as well. Uh, how many cream eggs? Too many, Ross. <laughs> More than you. <laughs> right, well, good stuff. Really enjoyed that today, Josh. I think that there is a lot more we could have gone into and we can do another day. But I think for for one episode, that, that was really amazing to, to hear your story and to get those insights. And as you say, I think for some people, there'll be a need for more of a chat just because it's more contextual and there's a bit of that relevancy on an individual level comes into play but broad taken away is that you know it, it's a good option to be an entrepreneur don't only think you have to be employed there are pros and cons to both when you're disabled there definitely can be work-life balance benefits i know from a lot of disabled entrepreneurs but again ross comes back with like his particular role has a lot of those benefits at a big organization so there's yeah pros and cons um funding there's lots of grants out there lots of awards to apply for there's access to work which can help with care equipment um and you know, even down to wheelchairs um and i'm going to cut the video of your sort of what skills an entrepreneur um, would be good to have and what you would need because i think that's quite a nice snappy sort of sound bite for follow up afterwards as well. Brilliant. And uh, Martin, just one one final thing. Um, I, I tend to use it in my presentations when I finish and I, it's normally always the last slide. Uh, and I'd like to leave the, the conversation with one quote. Um, and it's, uh, it's from Stephen Hawkins. Uh, and his quote was, intelligence is the ability to adapt to change. Um, and I think that sums up quite nicely what disabled people represent generally and the world that we live in now as entrepreneurs. And if you just keep that thought in, if you keep that quote in mind and actually really think about it, it's actually a very powerful quote. So, um, yeah, just keep that in mind. Yeah. Nice one. Thank you for that that That's parting right. thought. And uh, thanks for your time, Josh, and for giving up an hour of your bank holiday Monday. And uh, yeah. your, your nan's been a hit with the audience so thanks to your nan as well that's right she's a good egg she is a good egg i've met her at nadex and we all had a, a lovely dinner didn't we all together it was a lovely evening so I yeah nice to see her as well and what i've got now through 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 nan helping me it's mental i need to get her online really yeah. really like it i think she'd be quite famous to be fair yeah i agree i think there's a there's a whole media career for your nan there yeah, and 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 Ross, cool. sorry, finally Ross has um, hit the nail on the head that yeah, this session is relevant for all entrepreneurs, um, which is why some, true. True. some of the points around the skills and the vision and everything like that applies to everybody as well. So yeah, spot on. I'm gonna let yeah. you go. Martin. All right, cool, good. And tomorrow, as I mentioned, Gavin from Neatbox with that, their particular their welcome app, we'll be sharing more about what Neatbox does and what the Welcome app is and how technology um, and customer service is a big part of inclusion. So I'll see you all hopefully tomorrow, same time midday for the Daily Sip and enjoy the rest of your bank holiday. Bye all. Bye.